Hi everyone, this is Rob Roy and welcome to the LA Wave Options US Market Update. As we do each and every week, the stocks that you see on your screen will be the ones featured in this week's recording. And if you have a particular stock you're interested in, you can go directly to it using the chapters feature on the recording. All right, so let's take a look at the chart of the markets. As you can see, we did finish slightly to the upside today. Before I get further into the charts, we did have some economic news this week, some big economic news, starting off with the GDP report, which came in a bit hotter than expected. As you can see, the market grew at 3.3% uh, for the fourth quarter on a year-over-year -year basis, which was higher than expected. Then we had today the PCE deflator report, the Fed's favorite uh, inflation indicator, and it showed that it only rose 0.2% in December for a 2.9% uh, increase year over year. Uh, and that's getting down into the Fed's uh, comfort zone. So it was almost like, is this a Goldilocks scenario for the markets? Well, when we take a look at the markets, I would have thought that with those reports, we might have seen a bigger upward move uh, to the upside. We have been creeping higher. And I've always talked about the 45 degree angle is what you want. And the reason for that is when you have corrections, we all know the market moves in impulses and corrections. That's the crux of Elliott Wave. Uh, that uh, 45 degree angle is the ideal scenario because we don't have uh, as severe corrections uh, as we do when the market goes more vertical. So that can be viewed uh, from a constructive standpoint. However, breaking above 480, I thought we might make the shorts nervous. We might get a big short covering bar, especially with that PCE report, but maybe it's because now we're starting to move out the rate cuts. We had priced in a March rate cut. As you know, if you've watched these videos before, I'm not a fan of that. I don't think the Fed will cut in March. Now we're moving out to April. Some are talking about May. So maybe that's keeping just a little bit of a lid uh, on any sort of a spike to the upside. As you can see, the Ellie Wave algorithm does like the 500 level here for the SPY. And for those of you not familiar, the software is called Private Source. It's from the hub organization, hubb.com, where you can find out more information about it. Uh, and to me, it's the best LA Wave software out there because it's programmed exactly to the algorithm as Ralph Nelson Elliott himself wrote it, not some sort of personal adaptation of it. So crawling to the upside here, um, when you look at the moving averages, we're just kind of a little bit above that 10-day moving average. So really constructive movement to the upside, all all without that big upward bar that I thought we might get is the short say, ah, maybe we're not going to roll over and head back down uh, and you get a big short covering day. I think if we continue to creep up, we will likely see a, a big up day in the markets, but uh, we'll see how that plays out. Looking at the 10-year uh, rates down just a little bit today uh, on the low and closing slightly higher, but really pretty much the rates have done nothing since last week's recording. We're up near that 38.2% FIB level. And I would imagine that we haven't started the wave five lower yet because we are pushing out those rate cuts. And if we do start to see some worse economic news, I think the Fed is feeling that, oh, well, if the economy is growing uh, and the consumer was still spending, at least in the last quarter they did, but we'll see what happens when we get the first quarter data. Uh, perhaps we start seeing some weaker economic news and we get more, um, clarity on uh, when the Fed is going to cut rates, perhaps that's when we'll start uh, a little bit move lower in rates. So for now, they're just kind of staying status quo. The dollar has been very cooperative here, staying in that range that I've been talking about. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here because I've been talking about this for quite some time and we've gone sideways on the dollar as well, staying in this range here between 96 and 107, which is where I think we need to stay. Uh, and that's constructive for the markets. There is concern out there about the amount of debt that we're taking on. Uh, we did have a five-year auction on Tuesday, which I just highlight because uh, Rick Santelli is one of the guys I really watch when they do the auctions. Uh, and he gave the five-year auction a D minus rating. That's because the uh, bid to cover was only 2.3. And if you're not familiar with what that means, the bid to cover is how many people want uh, one security that's being offered. And that was the lowest reading since 1968. So it's showing that there are some uh, places around the world that aren't as uh, uh, you know, keen to uh, accept our debt. Uh, with these bond offerings that they have in the past. That may come to roost at some point in time, but so far 
uh, the markets have uh, shaken that kind of information off. Then we take a look at the VIX. Uh, we had a little bit of a bounce up, but we're moving back down, getting back down again towards this range around 12, 13, where we've uh, uh, found uh, support. Uh, the VIX isn't quite the indicator, in my opinion, that it once was when it was on the OEX. Now it's on the SPX, uh, but um, a little bit of room there uh, to go to the downside if uh, uh, rates or if the VIX uh, volatility wants to go down and the markets turn and go back to the upside. Maybe 12 level uh, if we continue higher or, or maybe we just continue to bounce around this area where we have since basically into November. Taking a look at some of our other markets, looking at the DIA, you can see nice move to the upside today, breaking above that level uh, at 380. So we had a nice consolidation there. It seemed like maybe people weren't so interested in the Dow, uh, but we came to the upside here, traded through that 380 level for about a week and then broke to the upside. So pretty constructive looking there. Uh, the DIA, as with the SPY, is in a wave three. Uh, when we look at the Qs, though, the Qs are in a wave five. We talked about this last week. Normally, the markets, they can be discombobulated for a while, but they usually get in line. What's going to happen? Is the Qs going to relabel to a wave three? Are the Qs going to relabel to a wave three? Um, it seems like that's the easiest way to get things in line. Um, normally, you don't have a wave three relabeled to a wave five, but you can have a wave five relabeled to a three. Uh, we've gone a bit sideways here. Uh, with the Qs, and that's a little surprising with rates not going significantly higher, although we were a bit overbought as we made this big run into this. But look how the tap box here, the time and price projection has absolutely nailed this move on the Qs, as Ellie Wave often does. Uh, so we had a fairly vertical move, gone a little sideways here, but allowing the 10-day moving average to catch up. So perhaps next week maybe if we move higher on the queues that five relabels to a three we'll have to see how that plays out that's one of the things i'm going to be looking for next week and then we take a look at the russell uh, the market that tends to march to the beat of its own drummer you can see that it's out of wave four labeled so it's completely different than the spy the dow or the uh, i uh, the queues uh, and we're just kind of going sideways here for the past week as well the key here on the IWM though, is it did hold 190 and that was the level that it needed to hold. Going back a ways, we had a range between 190 and 210. Then we broke down and we're between 170 and 190. Uh, as you all know, again, if you've been watching, uh, and so uh, holding 190 was key. Are we gonna break from this little consolidation and head up towards this wave five, which brings us pretty close to that 210 level. Uh, which is, uh, again, the trading range that we've been in for a while on the IWM. But at least they haven't broken down. Those of you that look at the small caps is an idea of risk tolerance for traders. Uh, small caps being viewed as a little bit riskier than the SPY or the Dow or even the Qs now. Um, so uh, pretty interesting uh, sideways consolidation here. We'll see if we Break out a tiny triangle here on the IWM. Not much of one, but Elliot always said, you know, don't discount the small triangles either. So it does look like next week we'll get some sort of a break uh, in the IWM. Um, as we start to move into stocks of interest, I want to remind everybody, this is the last recording for you to leave a comment uh, under this video so that you'll go into a drawing. Each and every month this uh, year, we're going to pull a name from those that have left comments and our subscribers to our channel here uh, and give away one of our level three subscriptions, which is worth multiple thousands of dollars. It covers directional trading, non-directional trading, and our proprietary AI-based uh, time strategy, which is looking to generate income from sideways markets. So leave a comment or let's leave your favorite Chuck Norris one-liner. I've got a story to tell you. Over the weekend, I was in Atlanta uh, at one of the World Marketplace showings. Uh, and while I was there, after that ended, and by the way, uh, I talked to as many vendors as I could. They were pretty happy with uh, the results that they were getting. We went to an Indian restaurant afterwards, right across the street from the marketplace, which is three large buildings. And after finishing dinner, went up to the register to pay. And the gentleman behind the register looked at me and said, hey, you remind me of Chuck Norris. 
<laughs> so I love the Chuck Norris comparisons. Get them a lot. So if you want to leave your favorite Chuck Norris one-liner under here as a comment, that'll get you registered for the drawing as well. So I always, uh, always enjoy that. So I wanted to share that story with you. All right, getting back to the stocks of interest. And when you leave a comment, I do read them. Uh, I try to answer as many as I can, um, but I do read every single one of them. And you all ask about Pfizer. Healthcare has just not been the place to be this week. Humana came out and uh, they were talking about higher medical costs hurting them. Uh, and Pfizer, you can see that is uh, looking like it wants to go down and test that wave five low. Uh, I just don't see where the catalyst is here. This is a chart to me that looks like it wants to go lower, as I said, and I would not be surprised to see Pfizer come down in this area uh, of the wave five and at least test that area through there. Y'all also ask about micro strategy and that'll tie in when we get to Bitcoin and Coinbase, which we will uh, in the recording. Uh, obviously, most people are aware micro strategy has a big investment in uh, Bitcoin. And so it kind of moves now more than a tech stock, more like uh, with Bitcoin. So we had this move down the way for Right there at 70%, awfully close to disqualifying this Elliott Wave pattern. Uh, when uh, I read uh, Ralph Nelson Elliott's uh, writings, and I, I didn't just read the published materials, I read his notes, etc. Hard to find, but you can find them. Uh, and he was talking about once a Wave 4 got to 70%, that was getting into... Uh, a land where you would get close to disqualifying an early wave pattern, admitting that 78.6 is the last bastion of FIB support. Uh, but once you pass 70%, you're getting awfully close to that. Well, we held that and bounced up a little bit uh, on micro strategy today. Uh, we also had a little bit of an up move in Bitcoin, as I'll uh, talk about in a minute, as I said. Uh, but uh, there's the bounce in micro strategy. Also, USO. Uh, we caught a little bit of a bid yesterday. I think that kind of had to do with the GDP report and the fact that it showed that the consumer was still spending. Uh, we do have a bit of an ascending triangle here. Uh, so we could be breaking out uh, of this ascending triangle. We have resistance there at 70 and then we have some higher lows. Uh, we did pull back a little bit today when these triangles break out. Uh, we talked about this on the live show. Uh, over on the Hub Financial uh, channel. If you haven't registered there, we do a live show every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So go over to the Hub Financial channel, subscribe there, and you can participate uh, in that um, each and every Friday. Um, but we talked about how these triangles can break in different directions. Sometimes they break and just go vertical. Sometimes they break and turn off into a 45 degree angle. And other times they break out and then come back and immediately test the breakout before moving higher. So can we continue a bid in oil next week? Another thing to keep an eye on. Uh, if we look at the width of this triangle, it's only five points. So we're only looking for a move uh, up to about 75 or so if this uh, breakout to the upside continues on oil. Uh, and we'll hit resistance there at 75. So if we can break it above 75, we got something else going on, but we need to do that first. And that's going to uh, pertell on whether or not the consumer is still strong. We have a number of earnings coming up. Amazon uh, is coming up next week, and uh, we'll get an idea of the consumer strength from there. And then y'all ask about PayPal, which is a really good one. Uh, kind of interesting news here on PayPal. Yesterday, they came out and said that they're working on their technology uh, and they're infusing AI into their technology. Usually, when you just mention the word AI, the stock breaks to the upside. ServiceNow had the same problem PayPal did, though. It moved to the downside when they talked about it. I just have to wonder... Was that kind of a sneaky uh, earnings warning coming in from PayPal? Like we've been spending a lot of money on this new technology, so it's going to hit the bottom line. So were they trying to slide in an earnings warning there on the back of AI so that it didn't hit the stock too much? We'll find out when we get to the earnings report. But it was interesting that uh, the CEO came out talking about uh, their AI infusion, and yet the stock went lower. And so Bitcoin, as I mentioned, we will talk about uh, Bitcoin. It's doing its best to hold 40,000 at the time of this recording, trading up today. So holding this 40,000 level right around a 50%
correction. Also on the Hub Financial channel, we had a uh, discussion on this and they were talking about how the unwinding from FTX, et cetera, um, there was some selling that had to occur in Bitcoin, uh, billions of dollars worth uh, that has uh, kind of been absorbed pretty well. Uh, and so even though we've had a pullback here, you can view that as being constructive with the fact that we held 40,000, still thinking that Bitcoin running into the halving that occurs on April 18th uh, could run up towards that 50,000 or higher level. And then we're going to talk about Bitcoin. We got to talk about Coinbase. So Coinbase so far has tried really hard to hold this 120 level. Uh, as you can see, we bounced off of it. It was resistance back in July. So that makes it now support. We're also at the wave four level of a 61.8% FIB correction. That's the strongest of all FIB levels in my opinion. So we really need to hold this 120 level. A lot of people thinking that those new Bitcoin ETFs were going to be a problem for Coinbase. And it seems like some of that was priced in. The move to the downside in Coinbase stronger than the move lower uh, in Bitcoin. Uh, but if we don't hold 120, then it starts to get a little dicey on Coinbase. We may start looking at 80, somewhere in this um, 70 to 80 range. Uh, and I think that would happen in a relatively short period of time because the move from 80 to 120 was pretty quick. So if we break 120 to the downside, we're probably moving down to 80. But so far, so good. We've held on Coinbase uh, at the 120 level. We'll be watching to see if that can continue into next week. And looking at Tesla, uh, everybody's aware of the earnings that they had. Uh, I did some reading uh, on Tesla and uh, in China, they're having problems. Elon talked about it uh, in the uh, conference post earnings. And China is in their EV space, uh, are working on all these really fancy electronic doodads for inside the car. In fact, some of their vehicles don't even have a dashboard. Uh, you project uh, the images and the data that you need, it's actually out onto the road. Uh, and so uh, the Chinese people are really enjoying uh, these electronic advancements, et cetera. Uh, so they're not focused so much on the body of the car uh, more than the electronics within it. Uh, and they're taking market share from Tesla there. And uh, Elon admitted that. And the other thing is that most of the batteries for these electronic cars are manufactured in China. And so it's an added cost for Tesla, et cetera. And Tesla's having to reduce their prices of their cars to compete. Uh, so there's a lot of negative news out there for Tesla. I know that's not gonna make any of the Tesla bulls happy, but that's the way it is. We're kind of in the middle of no man's land. I think we've been pretty spot on uh, with Tesla. We said if it broke below 240, we're probably gonna see 220, uh, which we did. And if it broke 220, we were likely going to see 200. Well, it went right through 200 like nothing uh, on the earnings report. And now we're kind of in the middle of no man's land. Uh, I think we might see Tesla creep down. We're a little bit oversold. I'll put the 10-day moving average on here. As you know, no security in any time frame gets too far away from the 10-day moving average. So we're a little oversold. Maybe we go sideways for a bit or a slight bounce. But I feel like we may see that 160 level on Tesla in the not too distant future. If we get there, then I think it's really interesting uh, to maybe take a shot going long uh, again on Tesla. Before I was saying that I would wanna see Tesla get above 240, but that was before we broke this 200 level in such a strong way. So if we drift down to 160, I think we have a tradable bounce there. Uh, but other than that, um, maybe we come up and fill this gap in the meantime. I just wouldn't wanna uh, take a risk on that uh, from my standpoint here, uh, I think we want to see how Tesla plays out over the next week or so before uh, committing more capital there. And then last but not least, the INDA. Uh, we talk about um, these markets uh, every Tuesday uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern time at TradeFinder. Uh, we talk about the markets. We look for trade ideas. Uh, we have a live Q&A so join us uh, if you haven't already you can see the link on your screen uh great community that we have at trade finder love to have you join us next week um, but we talk about the inda quite a bit uh, and one of the things that we talked about was how we had broken down here that was tuesday and we're wondering uh is that it because this 49 level is so important on the inda uh, and it needed to get back above 49 which it did 
the very next day. So holding back above 49, so that's constructive uh, for the INDA. A short wave four pullback right at the 23.6% FIB level here. Uh, that's not the strongest of all FIB levels, but so far for the INDA, it's been strong enough. It was able to get it back above 49, so we'll be watching that to see next week. Can we hold 49 and then potentially take off into this wave five to the upside, which is up around 52? I hope you have a terrific weekend. Look forward to talking again soon. Take care, everybody. If you like these recordings, I'd like to invite you to join our new Trade Finder Live, where each and every week we do a live webinar where we talk about the market, but we also go a little more in depth into the technical analysis system that we utilize to forecast where the market's likely going to go, and also to identify trading opportunities. Get your free subscription today. Take care, everybody.